Welcome, friends, to the seventh se session of our Secret Doctrine seminar. So far, we have explored the first two fundamental propositions that are found in the proem of the Secret Doctrine. And today, we are going to explore the third fundamental proposition. This is the last proposition that Madame Blavatsky explores or proposes, as the name of, of these ideas are, uh, proposes as a basis for the secret doctrine, which, as we have seen already, uh, they are based on uh, some stanzas that are found in the book of Zian. So this third fundamental proposition talks about basically the evolutionary cycle through which consciousness develops into self-consciousness. We are going to see this today. So the third proposition begins as follows. Moreover, the secret doctrine teaches the first, the fundamental identity of all souls with the universal oversoul, the latter being itself an aspect of the unknown root, and the obligatory pilgrimage for every soul, a spark of the former, through the cycle of incarnation or necessity, in accordance with cyclic and karmic law during the whole term. So Madame Blavatsky begins by establishing the fundamental unity of all souls with the universal oversoul. Although the subject of this proposition is the evolutionary cycle, she begins by pointing out that each individual soul is fundamentally one with the one universal soul. As you can see in the three propositions, Madame Blavatsky begins by pointing out to the unity that is behind everything. The first fundamental proposition was about the absolute, which is itself this common ground in, in which all manifested beings appear. The second fundamental proposition, which is about the law of periodicity or cycles, she begins, if you remember, by saying the, the eternity of the universe in total as a whole. So first she says the universe as a whole is eternal. And then within this eternity, we have cycles of time. Um, but she doesn't start right away with the cycles. And here again, she talks about the obligatory pilgrimage of every soul, but she starts by saying, by talking about the fundamental identity of every individual soul with the universal, universal over soul. So she's following what she said, as we saw in the first session, what she said about these four basic ideas that we have to keep in mind constantly. Namely, the, that everything is one, one being, then that everything is alive, there is no dead matter, then that the macrocosm it, um, is reflected in the microcosm, which is a human being. And then the, the final idea, which is a summary of these three, is that as it is above, so it's below, etc. So the same we are trying to do during this seminar, we are trying to keep always in mind these ideas. So we are constantly referring to this absolute reality, which is the only reality behind all changes, all appearances. And we are also trying to keep always in mind that whatever is applied on a universal level can also be applied uh, at the level of the human beings. So she says that um, there is this universal oversoul, which is an aspect of the unknown root. So she talks about the unknown root. This would not be so much the absolute reality. If anything, it would be called the unknowable root or the rootless root. Usually when there is this kind of names, uh, unknown, hidden, 
dark, uh, it refers to the first logos, the first logos which is unmanifested, and it is unknown because we don't see it, we don't perceive it, but it still is knowable by those who reach the, the necessary state of consciousness, while the absolute is unknowable, is beyond any knowledge. So this unknown root is the first logos, and she says that the oversoul is itself an aspect of the, this unknown root. This oversoul, in some other places in the secret doctrine, is called alaya, or is the sixth universal principle. So this unknown soul is at the universal level, what booty is at the level of human beings. And we are going to see that later. So she starts, as we said, by saying there are individual souls, many individual souls that we see on the plane of illusion which are basically, we are fundamentally the same as this uni over soul, which is universal. And in its turn, this over soul is nothing but an aspect of the unknown root, the first logos. So these universal souls, or individual souls, are engaged in a pilgrimage. So, she goes on talking about this obligatory pilgrimage for every soul, which is a spark of the former, a spark of the over soul. Each one of these souls can be seen as a divine spark from the universal soul. And this pilgrimage happens through the cycle of incarnation or necessity. So she talks about a cycle of incarnation or cycle of necessity. This necessity, this word necessity, means that um, this pilgrimage is obligatory, as she is saying, that nobody can refuse to be engaged in this cyclic incarnation until the aim of the evolution is accomplished. So this is nothing but the law of reincarnation. So basically she is talking about this pilgrimage for human beings, for the individual souls, through this cycle of reincarnation. As we already discussed briefly in one of our previous sessions, the cycle of reincarnation is a manifestation of this universal law of periodicity. And this reincarnation, in the theosophical view, as we are going to see, uh, happens only within the realm of human existence. That means that in the theosophical view, once a human being is a human being, will always reincarnate as a human being. Uh, there are other traditions, like in Hinduism and Buddhism, where they, they say that a human being could be reborn as an animal or even a plant. Well, in the theosophical view, that is a misunderstanding of, of a certain teachings. According to Madame Blavatsky, the, the lower principles in human beings, that means our, our body, our emotions, and even part of the, the lower basic mind can be if the person had a strong tendency towards the instinctual, towards the animal kind of life, after the person dies, those lower principles can incarnate or animate animal forms, and in so doing, they become coarser. 
So when the soul incarnates again as a human being and has to bring to take back the essence of those principles, the soul may find itself with a coarser kind of um, vehicle of consciousness. This is one interpretation that can explain why this idea of incarnating in animals. So in the theosophical view, as I said, once a soul attains the stage of humanity, of human being, it remains always within the realm of human beings. In this progressive cycle of incarnation, with the, the aim of becoming a fully self-conscious divine spark. And we are going to see that uh, presently when we go on with the fundamental proposition. So Blavatsky says that this cycle of reincarnation is uh, regulated by the law of karma. You have to remember that when Madame Blavatsky was writing The Secret Doctrine, these ideas of karma and reincarnation were very rare in the West. The, actually, the, f the first books that published the word karma in English outside the circle of the scholars in universities were the books by A.P. Sinet that were published about five years before The Secret Doctrine. Uh, before that, there was a mention to reincarnation and karma in some articles. And actually, Blavatsky wrote in Isis Unveiled against the idea of reincarnation. But she was referring to a concept that was developed or was being propounded at the time by the French spiritists that followed the, the philosophy of Allan Kardec. They were talking about reincarnation, but a kind of personal reincarnation, like Pablo will be reborn again in the future. But the idea in the theosophical view is that the soul, which is beyond uh, sex or, or race or any particular personal characteristic, it is the soul that reincarnates in different lives. And the personality that that, that soul is incarnating today is not going to be anymore in the future. The more spiritual aspect of the personality will become part of the soul, as we are going to see. But the personality as a whole will be forgotten or will, will die. And then a new personality will be developed. So the point is that when Madame Blavatsky talked about karma, reincarnation, and the law of cycles, um, all this was, was not very well known in the West. After the theosophical literature began to spread these ideas, when swamis from the Hindu tradition and some Buddhist monks began to come to the West, they had already uh, the ground prepared, and many people had a certain knowledge of these laws. So Blavatsky says, all this process of reincarnation is not random. It is regulated by the law of karma. The law of karma is this law of cause and effect, which brings a certain order and uh, continuity to the process. So that a soul incarnates in a particular life with the purpose of learning, learning on several levels. At the beginning, the soul is just learning about the physical plane. It's learning how to relate to this level of existence that is what we call the physical world. Then little by little begins to learn who he or she really is. Or if we talk about the soul, we should say it, because as we said, it's beyond sex. So during the process of reincarnations, the soul begins to try to discover its real nature. And also to develop the, the faculties, the abilities, the powers that are latent in, in the soul itself. So when a soul incarnates in a particular personality and uh, begins to relate to the world and to other people, the, the way that the soul learns is by this law of cause and effect. 
So in a very simple example, it's just like many children learn about many things in the world. So we touch something that is hot and that is a cause, the effect is that we are burnt and that's how we learn. So the soul begins to try to deal with the world and because of this law of cause and effect begins to understand, understand how the world works, what is right, what is wrong, what is really desirable and what is not. And by doing this, the soul little by little begins to realize that the, the basis or, or the, the method to attain what the soul is seeking, which is self-realization, is not by relying on external objects, but by coming back to a place of self-awareness, of awareness of itself. We are going to see all this. I'm just uh, trying to present a general idea. So this process of reincarnation is regulated by karma. Now, once Madame Blavatsky sets this up, she goes into more details. So she says, in other words, no purely spiritual body, divine soul, can have an independent conscious existence before the spark, which is the soul, which issued from the pure essence of the universal sixth principle, or the oversoul, has. So she says, no, no divine soul can have an independent conscious existence before it has gone through two stages that she describes now. A, passed through every elemental form of the phenomenal world of that Manvantara. Remember, Manvantara is the, that particular cycle of manifestation. And B, acquired individuality, first by natural impulse, and then by self-induced and self-devised efforts, checked by its karma thus ascending through all the degrees of intelligence, from the lowest to the highest manas, from mineral and plant up to the holiest archangel, uh, Dhyani Buddha. So now she gives a little more information about this. Um, let us examine this in more detail. So we have the oversoul. And then we have the individual souls. Let's say we have one, um, let us take one individual soul. This individual soul is um, said by Blavatsky to be Bodhi. Now, Bodhi is a Sanskrit word that means awakened or enlightened or even wisdom. And it is said that, that Buddha is like the seed of, of enlightenment in ourselves. Now this Buddha is the sixth principle. As you may have heard in the Theosophical view, there is a, a classification of human beings as having seven principles. The first principle, or seventh, according to how you count, let's say the seventh principle is Atman. Now this Atman is simply a ray of the absolute. This is like the absolute reality in us. So that Atman is immutable, it doesn't evolve, it's beyond any differentiation. Now this Atman expresses itself in the world of differentiation, in the world of manifestation, through Buddhi. So this Atma Buddhi principle is called in theosophy the monad. The word monad means one, and although it seems that there are two principles here, we have to remember that actually Atman is everything. So Buddhi is this and manifested universal absolute reality expressing into a differentiated state. So Buddha is 
Atman manifested in a sense, if you want to see it in that way. So that is called the monad. This is the divine spark. So Madame Blavatsky says that the, this divine spark, this monad, we could talk about Bodhi, and not always Atman is there, Atman is everywhere. So, but let's say this individual soul has to acquire, or let us start not by individual soul, because that's what she wants to explain here. Let's say the soul, the divine soul, um, has to acquire individuality, she says. So let me read. Um, so that, that spark, which issued from the pure essence of the universal sixth principle, which is the over soul, has to acquire individuality, first by natural impulse, and then by self-induced and self-devised devised efforts. So here we have the, the diagram of evolution that we were talking about in some of the other sessions with this U form, where there is an arc, a descending arc, and then there is an ascending arc. So in the theosophical view, there are seven kingdoms of nature. We know the minerals, the, an the plants, the animals, and human beings. In the theosophical view, human beings and animals are different because although our body comes from the animals, there is an element in human beings that is essential and that is not in animals. So from the, the esoteric point of view, human beings are a, in a different kingdom. And this element is what, what is called manas, as we are going to see. So there we have these four kingdoms, minerals, plants, animals, and humans. But there are also three previous kingdoms that are called elementals. So we can call elemental one, elemental two, elemental three. These elementals or kingdoms are a kind of conscious, are conscious forces, if we want to put it in that way. They are not really entities. Even at the level of minerals, we cannot talk about so much about entities. We could say, well, a particular stone could be seen as an entity, a particular entity, but that stone was part of a bigger stone. So the, at the level of minerals, we have like the transition between something that cannot be regarded as an entity in itself and something that can, begun to, can begin to be regarded as an entity. Then when we talk about plants, we can clearly say this is one plant different from the other. Um, so the elemental kingdoms are not really entities. These are like forces which are conscious, are in, remember, the second fundamental or basic idea that Blavatsky is talking about or to, that he taught to Bowen and some other students, is that there is no dead matter in nature. So every kind of matter, every kind of energy has also consciousness. Remember, there are these three basic principles uh, behind all manifestation. Spirit, that comes from the cosmic ideation. Matter, that comes from the cosmic substance. And energy, that comes from foha, the cosmic energy. So any kind of energy and matter has a kind of consciousness. These elementals are, they have a very elemental consciousness, and they are in a process of becoming more and more uh, dense, denser and denser, so that they are in, in the direction of becoming minerals. These elementals have to do with emotions, thoughts, and mental perceptions. So it is said that one kingdom of elementals has to do with the higher mind. The other kingdom has to do with the lower mind. And the third kingdom has to do with the emotional realm. 
and then we have the minerals. So what happens is that the soul, the divine soul, at the beginning of its evolution is Atma, Atma and Buri, and it's not individual. Atma is a universal principle, is the absolute, and Buri is also universal. The difference is that Atman is immutable, and Buri can acquire a kind of individuality. At the beginning of the evolution, Atma, this monad, Atma Buri, is a universal principle. There is one monad for the whole mineral kingdom. There is one monad for the whole elemental kingdom. So the, the elemental wave of evolution begins to give to this universal soul a, a certain quality of experiences, the experiences of what we could call mental perceptions. Then that consciousness keeps becoming more and more differentiated. And now in the second kingdom, it has the experience of mental thoughts, mental ideas. Then as it goes down, this soul begins to have the experience of what we call emotions. And finally, it becomes a mineral and has the experiences that minerals have. So this descending arc corresponds to the point A that Madame Blavatsky explains in the fundamental proposition. So she says that the, the spark has to pass through every elemental form of the phenomenal world of that Manvantara. This is the first stage. And then it has to acquire individuality. So we have seen that as it goes into minerals and plants and animals, it begins to acquire a kind of individuality. The individuality begins to be obvious on the external level. It is said that plants and animals, they have what is called a universal soul, a um, group soul. But this is a teaching that it, it was given more by later theosophists. Madame Blavatsky, as far as I am aware, didn't talk so much about this. But the idea is that on the external aspect, the, the this universal or this divine soul begins to acquire a certain individuality. And this individuality is acquired by natural impulse. It's not that a plant is trying to be, to be a, an individual and to develop its own characteristics. That happens, nature produces that. The same with an animal. So we, we, we have the soul becoming more and more in the, of an individual simply by natural impulse. But then when we come to the human kingdom, there is something that happens. This is the acquisition of manas. Manas is a Sanskrit word which means something like to think. So when the, the divine spark reaches the human kingdom, the, these two principles, the monad, Atma Buri, are associated with the third principle, which is mind, which is manas. So now the monad begins to develop a mind of its own, or to be associated to a particular mind. This principle of manas has two qualities, two characteristics. One is the ability to think, and the other one is the sense of self-consciousness. As we said, there is no consciousness nor unconsciousness at the level of Atman. Remember when we were describing the absolute reality, we said it's neither conscious nor unconscious. Then at the level of Buddhi, there is the first, the first manifestation of consciousness, although it is a very, we could call it an unconscious consciousness, in a sense. It is a unity, universal consciousness, but it's not self-conscious at all. You know, there is a difference between consciousness and self-consciousness. 
Consciousness is the ability to respond to the environment. So, for example, when we faint, we are unconscious, physically speaking. We cannot respond to the physical stimuli. Um, a plant is conscious because it can respond to the environment in a very limited way, but it follows the sun, it responds to the, the weather, etc. An animal obviously has a much more developed consciousness. Even a mineral has a consciousness of its own, very primitive or very germinal, as in a germ. But the, the stone responds to big pressures or temperatures or conditions in, in the environment, you know. So we call them chemical reactions. But in the theosophical view, as I mentioned, these chemical reactions are, are the very primitive manifestation of consciousness. So consciousness is the ability to respond to the environment. Self-consciousness is the recognition of oneself as being an individual, a particular individual. So you can see in many animals, uh, or in most animals, that they don't recognize themselves if they see a mirror. They will think it's another animal. And it is said that most animals don't have this sense that they are an entity. Even a baby doesn't have the, uh, the, the idea that he is an entity. As it is explained in psychology, the baby feels one with the mother. There is not this idea of the difference between the, the body of the mother and his body. It is with experience that he begins to recognize that the two are separate entities. Now, he is able to do that because the principle of manas, which is the one that, that gives this sense of self awareness, self-consciousness, is already in a human being. So the first, through the first three kingdoms, manifested kingdoms, mineral, plants, and animals, the, the divine soul begins to acquire a kind of individuality. But it is when it reaches a human kingdom and acquires manas that the sense of self-awareness, self-consciousness dawns into that consciousness. Now at the beginning, this monad, which is associated to manas, has to develop this self-consciousness. Just as uh, in the example that I gave about the baby, although the germ for self-consciousness is there, it takes some months and even years for the baby to develop this sense of self-awareness. So in the same way, at the beginning of human evolution, the monad has to develop gradually the sense of being a particular center of consciousness. This, at the beginning, produces some problems, or produces something that will be a problem later, which is the idea of separation. The monad, which is originally and fundamentally one, one with the universal soul, as Madame Blavatsky says at the very beginning of this proposition. So the monad that is one, now because it associates with manas, begins to feel separation, begins to feel that, the, that it is different from others. If we would um, draw a diagram about this, we could say this is the, the monad, the universal monad. And the universal monad has several rays. These rays are all the differ different individualities. The circles that I'm drawing would rep represent manas. But they are not really different. They are just as if we have the hand and we have the fingers. The fingers are a particular um, growth of the whole hand. They are part of the hand. They are not different from them. But it looks like if the finger were separate, like if the fingers were uh, independent. But the one that sees the whole hand recognizes that they are just the hand. So in the same way, Every human being, every mind, every self-aware 
person is just an expression of the one being. But at this point of evolution, most people, most fingers, think that they are separate, independent, different. And that produces what we call selfishness. Now, at the beginning of the evolution, this is necessary because the point is that this monad has to develop a sense of self-awareness. At the beginning of the evolution, as we said, Atma Bodhi is divine, but is unconscious of that divinity. At the end of the evolution, when we go back to the, to the beginning in this U-shaped diagram of evolution, when the, the soul goes through the whole cycle and comes back to the, the real state, to the original state, there is a feeling of being one again, or there is the recognition of having always been one. But now there is this new element, the recognition of oneness that wasn't before. Now, at the beginning, there was unconscious unity. At the bottom of the, the cycle, there is a conscious separation. And then at the end, there is a conscious unity. So the whole cycle was to develop this consciousness, this awareness of the unity. And the difference is similar to the difference between the state of consciousness of a baby and an enlightened being. As we said, the, the baby feels one with everything. But that feeling is not self-aware, is unconscious in a sense. Now, the human, the human being that reaches enlightenment goes back to this feeling of oneness. But now he knows that he's one. There is this, this element of recognition, this element of self-awareness. And that is very important. Some psychologists, as uh, Freud, for example, he would talk about these experiences of unity as if it were a regression to the state of the baby or the fetus where there was no separation. But it is strange that he didn't recognize this basic and fundamental and very important difference between these two states where the enlightened being is fully aware of this unity. So it's not a regression. It is a regression or a coming back to the original state, but it's actually an evolution because there is this very fundamental element that is gained, the element of recognition, self-awareness. So the idea of the process of evolution, as, as uh, we are seeing, is to develop self-awareness in the divine. The divine, in this case, is the monad. And by incarnating in a separate center of consciousness, it begins to generate this sense of I am. I am different from the rest. Now, that sense of difference, that sense of separation at the beginning of evolution is too material to be able to affect the monad. You know, you, you could see the monad as something that is very subtle, very spiritual. And at the beginning, when it is associated to the principle of manas, and manas develops this gross sense of separation, the monad cannot really profit from that sense of separation. Uh, actually, the, what the, the monad needs is a very subtle sense of being. But at the beginning, as, as I'm saying, that sense of being is, is too selfish, too gross. So what happens is that in the course of this process of reincarnation, the first part of the evolutionary cycle as a human being deals with making this center of consciousness, this separate center of consciousness, stronger. You know, remember, we come from a vague sense of unity. So the first step is to develop a very clear, strong sense of I am myself. And so we have at the beginning of the evolution, the, the aim of it is to produce selfish people or self-centered people, if you want to put it that way. It's a, 
a kind of crude way of talking about this, but if you, if you see the, the life of a normal human being, these same processes are repeated. Remember, one of the basic ideas is that what is above, it is below also. There is a, a law that repeats on different levels. So you have the baby, which has this very vague sense of existence. Then as the baby develops into a child, he or she begins to develop this sense of I am, I am myself, different from the rest. And that sense is very selfish. A, a, a child is very selfish, but that is only natural. And he needs to be attended and taken care of. And it's natural that the, the whole world goes around this particular child in, in his consciousness. Now, as the child grows and goes through the teen years into an adult, in a healthy development, he begins to transcend this very strong sense of selfishness, of self-centeredness, begins to recognize others, begins to, to recognize the sense of responsibility to others. So when he becomes a, a parent, um, he is able to give up his own welfare or, or pleasure to take care of his children or wife or husband. So uh, the idea is that as the, the process of growth goes on, the sense of selfishness begins to be subtler, begins to be wider in the sense of the, the, the identification with the self begins to expand. So that now you are not identified only with your body, but now you are identified also with your family. So now at the beginning, when you were a teenager or a, a child, all that mattered was your particular welfare, your body, your needs. Now when you have a family, you grow and you have a family, now you begin to forget if you are a healthy person, psychologically speaking, you begin to forget to a certain extent your personal needs for the welfare of your family, your, your partner. And then as this adult grows, he may be, begin to be committed to the welfare of the city and do something for the people who, who have a, a difficult situation, a difficult position in life or in, in any field. And eventually he also, so he say he's willing to deprive himself of rest or money or whatever it is to help others. He identifies himself with these others. And that can be expanded to the country or to the whole humanity. So what happens in this process is that the sense of I am begins to expand from the body to eventually the whole universe. And then we have an enlightened being. So that is what happens with the monad during this process of evolution through reincarnation. First, there is this strong identification with the body and the emotions and the particular mind. So the person acts according to his or her own selfish needs. But since the reality is not separation, but unity, every time that the, the soul engages in self-centered activities, that produces a kind of suffering, a kind of sorrow, because it's acting against what really is, which is unity. So through the process of reincarnation, the soul, little by little, begins to learn that working for the self is working for suffering, for sorrow. It begins to recognize that oneself is not so much the body, the, the limited body or the personal emotions or personal mind, but a universal concern. So because there is the law of karma that produces the right results to the actions that, that the soul produces, the soul little by little begins to realize all this. And it is through karma and reincarnation that the process of evolution takes place. So 
as Madame Blavatsky says, let us um, see the last part of the proposition. So she says that the, the soul needs to acquire individuality, first by natural impulse, as we saw through mineral, plants, animal, up to the human kingdom, and then by self-induced and self-devised efforts, checked by, he, by its karma. So the idea is that once we acquire a mind, then we acquire responsibility. This is uh, shown in a, in a, in a kind of um, parable, if we want to call it, in the, the idea of the, the story of the Genesis. Adam and Eve were in the paradise. They, they had no worries. They were taken care of. They were just part of this natural paradise. And then when they eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then they are cursed and they are expelled from the paradise. In the theosophical view, this fruit is the mind. Now they, they acquire the ability to distinguish or to know good and evil. You know, this is the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Before they were like animals and they were taken care of by nature. Now that, that humanity acquires the mind, begins to differentiate good and evil, and therefore acquires responsibility to do what is right and to avoid what is wrong. Therefore, the first thing that they see is that they are naked. What does it mean? It means that they recognize themselves, this acquirement of self-awareness. An animal doesn't know that he's naked because it, it, it doesn't have self-awareness. So the idea of recognizing himself as naked is a symbol for the recognition, this is my body, I am an entity, and you are a different entity, and you have a different body. So when humanity is expelled from the paradise, means now the evolution that was by natural impulse before, now has to be self-induced and self-devised. Now the human being has to take the evolution in, it, in his or her own hands. Not that nature completely abandons humanity. We are always being nurtured by nature and its laws, the laws of karma, reincarnation, evolution. But now we will reap the results of our own actions. So Madame Blavatsky says that in this way, we need to ascend through all degrees of intelligence, from the lowest to the highest manas. The idea in theosophy is that manas, and this is something we are going to explore in detail tomorrow, but the idea is that manas has two levels, what we could call the higher manas and the lower manas. Now, the lower manas is personal. And the higher manas is spiritual. The idea is that the lower manas is our normal mind, the mind that is concerned, the mind that we know, the mind that is concerned with my needs, uh, or even the needs of people that I identify with. Uh, of course, to be responsible for one's family is a step forward in this process of breaking through the self-centeredness. But at the same time, it contains elements of selfishness. Because if I'm identified with my family and there is a conflict with another family, I will be willing to uh, harm the other family to defend mine. So if, when we realize, when the enlightened being realizes that the other family and my family are not different, and not even the family and myself are different, but we are just one, and every person is an expression of, of the one, which is myself, then there is no selfishness. But as long as we are identified with a part, there is a degree of selfishness. As I said, there is a gradual process, so being identified with a larger part 
is better than with a very small part, but still is part of the, uh, has elements of selfishness. So the person at the lower manas is this personal mind that is concerned with myself and what is mine, what belongs to me. The higher manas is a more abstract aspect of our mind. Uh, it's the mind that is not concerned with the, the material or the personal or the, the differentiation. The higher mind is more concerned with the origin of things, with the archetypes, with the universals, with uh, the unity. We are going to see all this more in detail in the next session. But the idea is that um, at the beginning of evolution, consciousness is that the begins to operate on the monastic level at the lowest level, with this very, as I was saying, very gross or primitive form of self-awareness, which is very selfish. That form of self-awareness is not particularly useful for, to the monad. The monad cannot relate to that. As evolution goes on, that sense of self-awareness becomes subtler and subtler. So when it becomes spiritual, the monad can, so to say, absorb the sense of self-awareness. So we have this, the experience of the enlightened being. He knows that he is, but that sense of being is so subtle that he knows that he is one with everything. So there is not a sense of self-awareness identified with a particular form, be it the body, the emotions, the mind or an individual soul. An enlightened being transcends even the identification with an individual soul, which is still an illusion, it's not part of the one. So Madame Blavatsky says that the, the spark, the divine spark, has to ascend from the lowest to the highest manas. And then she recaps and says, from mineral and plant, up to the holiest archangel, Dhyani Buddha. So the Dhyani Buddha is like the, the next cycle of evolution once a human being accomplishes that particular stage of evolution, we have the angelic evolution, if we want to call it that way. But we are not going to go into that uh, right now. So the last sentence in this fundamental proposition says, the pivotal doctrine of the esoteric philosophy admits no privileges or special gifts in men, meaning human beings, save those won by his own ego through personal effort and merit throughout a long series of metempsychosis and reincarnations. So she says that the basic doctrine of the esoteric philosophy admits no privileges or gifts to human beings. That means the idea of the grace of the guru in the sense that somebody can save me, or the idea of a savior, that somebody can save us or give us an enlightenment from the outside. That idea is completely foreign to the, the esoteric philosophy. Um, we are the result of what we have done in the past. Of course, we are all interrelated. We are all influencing each other. So to a certain extent, we are the result not only of our own efforts, but of the whole environment, the whole humanity, and the whole cosmos. And that is true, because ultimately speaking, everything is one. But then, relatively speaking, we are basically the, the result of our own efforts. So in the theosophical view, there is nothing like just trust in a person, in an enlightened person, and then he or she will take care of your karma, will take care of your growth, will take care of your evolution. The idea of grace, the grace of the guru as it is in, in, the, West, in the East, or the idea of a savior, may be an important element in, in the spiritual path. 
but only when it is rightly understood. The idea of thy will be done, not mine, is very healthy. If we understand that my will as a personal self, as a personal ego, is, is something that has to be surrendered to the universal will, be it the higher self or, or a divine person like the, the Christ or a guru, whatever it is. If you take it in that way, in the way of surrendering your personal will to the will of the divine, then that may become an important element in the spiritual practice. If it develops also a complete trust so that you say, whatever happens in my path, be it good or bad, pleasurable or sorrowful, whatever happens is part of the will of God or the guru or whoever it is, and therefore I'll take it. That is very important. When we say, if we think of the grace of the guru as being that higher consciousness that comes when we are in a state of silence, of listening to, then again, it's an important element. But when the idea is misunderstood and is taken in the sense of, well, somebody's going to rescue me, so I don't have to put any effort in this. I just have to believe or to, to chant a mantra or to do some easy trick and then I will be saved. That is very uh, harmful for the evolutionary process because that person st stagnates. There is nothing that will be given to the person unless the person produces the causes. It's just like pretending that there would be fire here spontaneously all of a sudden without any cause. That's not how the universe works. So if the person stops trying to grow, learn, develop wisdom or, or virtues, then the next lifetime is not going to, to have any, any growth in particular, any um, advance. In, 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 the, in the pilgrimage. So this is why it is important to realize that there are no gifts bestowed upon us. We need to become responsible and to, do, to, to take life into our own hands. So she says that any result is there or, or anything that happens in, in life will be the result of personal effort through this long series of metempsychosis and reincarnations. The word metempsychosis is, is applied in different ways, in different contexts. It was used by the Greeks. Sometimes it was used with the same sense of reincarnation. Sometimes it was used to, the, to refer to the idea of reincarnation into um, different kinds of beings. Or sometimes it is used in a more, because metempsychosis is talking about the psyche. So it could be interpreted as like deaths and rebirths within a particular life. Like these changes, these breakthroughs that we, we can experience during our, our one particular incarnation. But whatever the interpretation, the general meaning, I think, is clear. And that through this long process of reincarnation, which is regulated by karma, nothing that comes to us is given or is unfair. Everything that happens is a result of previous actions. Now, because the law of karma is basically a law of opportunity, of learning. Everything that happens to us, whether it is pleasurable or unpleasant, can, can be a, a blessing in the sense of teaching us, uh, help us realize or help us purify, and therefore help us realize the truth. 
because suffering in the theosophical view is just the result of going against reality. You know, the reality of unity, if we act based on a sense of separation, that produces an effect which is perceived by our consciousness as suffering. Because what we call suffering is simply the result of going against what we really are, which is this one being. So any suffering in life is basically a pointing out towards reality, towards what we are, or it's a process of purification of what we are not. Is the, the work of nature removing from us what we are not, be it a habit, a desire, a wrong idea, or whatever it is. So the whole process of evolution guided by karma and using the, the, the personal effort of that particular soul will take the soul to the realization of its true nature. And this is why we say that life is the great master, because it is by going through the experience of life with an open mind that we can learn who we really are and what this all is about.